In The Fly, the ever kooky and charismatic Jeff Goldblum plays Seth Brundle, who, in his warehouse laboratory, is on the verge of a great discovery. Teleportation pods that can transport matter from one pod to another. The only problem is it doesn't work on living organisms. He teams up with a scientific journalist called Veronica, played by Gina Davis, who agrees to record his progress as he tries to crack the code for teleporting humans, where a romance blooms between the two. After successfully teleporting a baboon, Brundle uses the machine on himself, without knowing that a common house fly flew into the pod with him, and after doing so, by teleporting he fuses their genetic codes together, where Brundle starts to become Brundle Fly, as his body starts to mutate, in which body parts start to drop off. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. Do not watch this while eating. And what's worse is Veronica discovers that she is pregnant with Seth's baby, and believes that she may have a similar abomination growing inside her, where she seeks help from her former jealous lover, Staphis. In this revolting but awesome 1986 classic Canadian body horror movie. So, it's time to get the sick bags ready, as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about The Fly, the film that truly celebrates Jeff Goldblum's awesome acting quirks. So, let's check it out. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Number 10, Origins of the Fly. The Fly originally started as a short story written by French-British writer George Langelan, where it was published as a short story in Playboy magazine in June 1957. One year later in 1958, The Fly short story was adapted into a feature film by 20th Century Fox and starring Vincent Price and David Hedison. Both the short story and movie are actually very similar. They are about a scientist called Andre, who works in his home laboratory, who has a wife and child, who is inventing a machine which can transport matter from one location to another. However, while experimenting on himself, a fly gets caught in the process, leaving Andre with a fly's head and a fly's claw. Which in turn means that somewhere out there, there is a fly flying around with Andre's head. Andre's wife and son must try to find the fly so Andre can fix the genetic mishap before the fly's nature consumes his humanity. Despite the fact that many critics found the fly to be shocking, it was still hugely successful, becoming one of 20th Century Fox's biggest hits of that year. And it would spawn two sequels, with The Return of the Fly, which would focus on Andre's now grown-up son, of which was actually filmed in black and white despite the original being filmed in colour, and The Curse of the Fly, which was filmed in the UK and was released in 1965. It's really funny reading old reviews of the original 1955 Fly, because critics generally thought the movie was revolting and horrific. And really, it was nothing compared to the remake. Number 9. The remake wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks may have been the king of comedy thanks to directing many comedy classics like Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, it also seems that he's the king of saving troubled productions, The Fly being one of them. The Fly remake was first set in motion in the early 80s, when a remake was pitched to 20th Century Fox, who were enthusiastic about making an updated version of The Fly. Scriptwriting duties were given to Dragonheart scriptwriter Chris Edward Pogg, where he and producer Stuart Kornfeld decided to change the formula of the original story. Instead of having a scientist with a fly's head, they changed the concept into a slow metamorphosis, with the scientist slowly changing in time, turning into a fly-human hybrid. So with the script completed, 20th Century Fox <gasps> didn't like the script and shut the project down. Yeah. Producer Kornfeld then managed to negotiate a deal, whereby 20th Century Fox would distribute the fly, but it would have to get its funding somewhere else. Thankfully, Kornfeld had already previously worked with Mel Brooks, as the two had produced The Elephant Man. So Kornfeld took the fly script to Brooks, and he liked it, so his company, Brooks Films, came on board to produce this new, updated version of The Fly. 
Brooks also insisted that his name not be in the credits, as not to confuse the audiences who may have thought that the movie was a comedy. Number 8. Tragedy Would Cause a Change in Directors The first choice for directing this 1980s retelling of The Fly was Canadian film director David Cronenberg, whom had already proven to be talented when it comes to surreal body horror in cinema, thanks to his previous movies, Scanners and Videodrome. However, Cronenberg was too busy at the time, working on the science fiction movie of what would eventually become Total Recall. So the duties of directing were then given to uprising British film and TV director Robert Bierman, who, with the rest of the production, started to work on his vision of the fly. However, during the pre-production stage, Bierman and his family went on a holiday to South Africa, where Bierman's daughter was tragically killed in an accident. The production of The Fly went on pause for several months, after which Bierman said that he just could not return, so he was relieved from his contract. Bierman, however, would go on to direct the extremely underrated Vampire's Kiss, and it's a shame that we never got to see his vision of The Fly. But the greatest shame is the terrible loss that he suffered. Number 7. Cronenberg changed the script to add his Cronenberg-isms. When the production of Total Recall had collapsed, David Cronenberg was yet again offered the chance to direct The Fly. This time he agreed. However, Cronenberg wanted to make changes to the script. The original script was written by Charles Edward Pogg, as mentioned, and elements of his original script were actually in the final film, while also having several differences that Cronenberg added. For example, just like the original 1958 movie, the remake script focused on a husband and wife duo, this time Jeff and Barbara Powell and the fly metamorphosis happens quite early in the film, where Jeff turns into a giant fly shortly after he experiments on the teleportation pod. And in the original script, the tech boss who the main character is working for is called Philip DeWitt, who acts as the movie's villain, who eventually steals the teleportation pod and takes it back to his office block, where there is a standoff between him and the fly. Cronenberg changed the main characters to Seth Brundle and Veronica, who aren't married but rather a scientist and reporter who start a romance during Brundle's teleportation experiments. And Philip DeWitt became Staphis, who is now Veronica's boss and former lover, and not a villain, but rather a love triangle opponent for Brundle. And the fly isn't a giant fly, but rather something entirely different. A weird hybrid of messing with genes which has created something that looks like it's made up of both human and insect DNA. And it's pretty ghastly. I always feel that the big Brundlefly creature reveal that we see at the end kind of looks like a hideous fleshy tumour. Number 6. Casting so with the filming set to start in Toronto, Canada 1985, the production had to find the right cast to bring this body horror drama to life. Without a doubt, Jeff Goldblum is the main attraction when it comes to The Fly. His bizarre mannerisms and other quirks completely carry the movie in a very appealing way. However, he wasn't the original choice for the part. That was in fact John Lithgow, who when being offered the part, found it too grotesque. So the role of Brundlefly was of course given to Goldblum. Gina Davis was cast as Veronica, as she was in a relationship with Goldblum at the time, which definitely enhanced their on-screen chemistry. You really feel the connection between these two. American actor John Getz got the role of Staphis, Veronica's boss and former boyfriend, who goes from unlikable jealous lover to someone who generally tries to help and support Veronica. Getz got the part because during his audition he had a horrible headache, which caused him to talk and hold his head in a certain way, which Cronenberg really liked. However, there were some issues with filming on the set, as while filming scenes with Gina Davis and John Getz, Goldblum would often get very jealous, once again on the account that he was in a relationship with Davis in real life. And it got so bad, he was even told to leave the set. But I think that that real-life tension actually enhanced the emotional love triangle aspect of the movie. Number 5. The Effects of the Fly the Fly naturally is a movie that is very heavy on makeup effects, so Chris Wallace was brought on board to create the creature effects for The Fly, as well as the Brundlefly makeup effects, as Wallace had previously created the Gremlin creatures for the movie Gremlins. His metamorphosis makeup of Brundlefly was in eight stages, where we would see Brundlefly with skin irritations, to the point where his body is slowly decomposing into a giant cocoon, till we see the giant mutant fly creature at the end. 
Brundle's transformation has often been seen as a metaphor for disease and old age and the dying process in general. And to be honest, it's awesomely hideous and gruesome. The effects of the fly are brilliant and still look impressive even by today's standards. And it's all thanks to the craft of Chris Wallace. Jeff Goldblum had it tough, as he would have to spend hours in the makeup chair as his Brundle fly makeup and bodysuits were being applied, all of which were very heavy and made it difficult to walk around in. The teleportation pods themselves were actually designed by director David Cronenberg, who based their look on the engine cylinder of his motorbike. And it totally works, as they do look very insect-like. In fact, that's not the only time Cronenberg's love for motor vehicles played a part in the creative process of the fly, as Cronenberg got the name Brundle from the Formula One racer, Martin Brundle. Number 4. Deleted Scenes the original cut of the movie was longer, and if you can believe it, even more horrific, which is saying something considering how horrific the final film actually is. After screening the first cut to an audience, it was decided that some of the movie was going to have to be trimmed. The most famous of these scenes includes a scene where Brundlefly uses his teleportation pods to fuse a cat and baboon together, creating a monstrous baboon-cat hybrid, which Brundle then kills with a lead pipe. This scene was actually in the original script before Cronenberg did rewrites. Another fascinating aspect of this scene is it shows Brundlefly in a metamorphosis stage that's not seen in the final film. And the scene ends with him on the rooftop of his building, gnawing off on an insect antenna that is piercing through his torso. There were also several alternative endings that were filmed. Ones that were to address the situation of Veronica being pregnant. One of these endings was to see Veronica and Staphis together as a couple, where it's announced that Staphis is the father of Veronica's baby. Something that Jeff Goldblum was very, very against, which I agree with, as it would have dismissed the tragic love story between the Veronica and Seth characters. Another alternative ending just saw Veronica lying in bed, pregnant and seemingly content, as if suggesting she's having the baby and that everything is A-OK. -okay. Without a doubt, the weirdest alternative ending is the infamous Butterfly Baby, where Veronica has a dream that a baby with butterfly wings emerges from her womb and flies into a bright light. I think this one was meant to be more poetical and symbolic, but I don't know, to me it just seems silly. After all, why would the baby have butterfly wings when it's a descendant of a fly? I think the ending we got is much better, where it shows Veronica shooting Brundlefly, whom had just been spliced with the pod. It's sudden and shocking, leaving a lasting impression. Literally ending with a bang and not a whimper, and leaves you the viewer wondering what will happen with Veronica's baby, which is okay. Sometimes not knowing the answers and leaving things a mystery is better. There was also another deleted scene where after Brundlefly uses his vomit to remove Staphis's foot, he then eats the foot but that was considered too gross. Interestingly, Staffis actor John Getz kept the foot prop in his refrigerator. Man, I wonder what would have happened if guests opened up his refrigerator and saw that. <laughs> Number three, aborted tie-in pop song. Now it's not uncommon for movies to have tie-in pop songs. Heck, I talk about it all the time in this show and The Fly was to be no exception. British singer-songwriter Brian Ferry of Roxy Music was commissioned to record a song for The Fly, so the singer went from being a slave to love to a slave to Brundlefly's vomit, as he performed the song Help Me, which was originally marketed as the theme for The Fly. It's your standard 1980s love ballad, but yeah, it's kind of weird having this lovey-dovey song used to promote a movie about a guy whose ear falls off, who stores his body parts in a cupboard. There was a music video put together, where we see the standard artsy shots of Ferry singing in black and white, while clips of the movie are inserted into the video. Now, there's nothing wrong with the song, but it just doesn't go with the fly. And thankfully, Cronenberg eventually felt that the song was inappropriate for the movie, so he dropped plans for Help Me to be played over the fly's end credits. And instead, the song was inserted into the background of the bar scene. The song became somewhat lost and obscure, and wasn't added to the Fly soundtrack. It was, however, eventually sold commercially when it was added to the Best of Roxy Music and Brian Ferry Collection in 1993. Number 2. Failed Sequels There was a sequel to The Fly which came out in 1988 and was directed by Chris Wallace who did the makeup effects for the first Fly as mentioned, and it starred Eric Stoltz as Seth's son, Martin Brundle. 
but I won't say too much about the sequel as that deserves its own episode. However, over the years there have been many other attempts to make a sequel to The Fly. First off, during the 90s, Gina Davis and her then-husband, Rennie Harlan, were working together on a sequel called Flies, which would have ignored the events of the 1988 sequel, and according to Wikipedia, would have carried on from the first movie and seen Veronica give birth to twin boys. But the sequel never ended up happening, and Davis and Harlan ended up getting a divorce. Then in 2003, it was announced that there would be another Fly remake, which was scheduled to be released in 2006, and that also didn't end up happening. Then in the late 2000s and early 2010s, there were rumours that David Cronenberg himself was working on a new Fly movie, which Cronenberg said wasn't a remake, but a sort of sequel to his movie, a sidebar so to speak. He said that he was commissioned to write a script, but the studio didn't like his script as they wanted something with a low budget, but Cronenberg had written something that would have required a large budget. Despite the fact that there are often rumours of sequels and remakes, The Fly did return in the form of an opera. Yeah, an opera based on the life and times of Brundle Fly. The Fly Opera premiered in Paris 2008 and was directed by Cronenberg himself and used music by Howard Shaw, who scored the Fly movie. And his score is brilliant, by the way. Very powerful and epic and full of emotion. And the opera was basically a retelling of the movie. However, it seems to be largely forgotten nowadays. I mean, I never hear anyone talking about the Fly opera. Seriously, we need to talk about the Fly opera more often. I can't believe this exists. Number one, the Fly grossing out the box office. The Fly was released in August 1986 and would go on to make over $60 million on a budget that sat somewhere between $9 to $15 million, making it a financial hit, and it would go on to win an Academy Award for Best Makeup. The Fly also got tons of praise from critics and fans alike, who praised both the effects and Jeff Goldblum's performance. Even the movie's tagline, Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid, became hugely popular and frequently referenced and parodied. So much so, the phrase has become just as ingrained in pop culture as the movie itself has. The film is now considered a science fiction horror classic, a movie loved by millions of fans all over the world, with Time magazine listing it as one of the top 100 greatest movies of all time, as well as it being ranked 33 on Bravo's list of 100 scariest movie moments. But The Fly goes beyond all that. Despite The Fly being a story about a man losing his humanity and turning into a monster, there is something very human about this movie, which seems to hit its audience on a personal level. Because underneath all the vomit and falling off body parts, The Fly, by all tents and purposes, is a tragic love story. It explores themes that are very real and very heartfelt, like having to deal with a loved one who is dying, and the pain and struggle of having to prepare for the worst and learning to let go. Which is a tragic situation that sadly so many people have gone through. It's just the teleportation and mutant fly creature is what is used to tell this tragic and heartfelt story. This was a bold direction to take a movie that is a remake of a 1950s B-movie, and I can't praise The Fly enough for deciding to be more of an emotional human story, and the heart that it delivers on screen. It's a movie that will repulse you, yes, but it's also a movie that'll still tug on your heartstrings. The Fly is a very emotional movie. By the end, you feel like you've been on an epic roller coaster ride of emotions with plenty of disgust along the way. This is without a doubt one of my favourite movies ever, and it's a film that everyone should check out at least once. But seriously, the Cronenberg Fly sequel, come on Hollywood, get this made, we need this. Anyway, I'm Minty, and remember, if you ever do watch The Fly, maybe you should see it on an empty stomach. See ya!